Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session of the AFMS seminar series. It's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Associate Professor Daniel Niu from the School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Nanyang Technological University. Daniel earned his PhD in Mechanical Engineering in 2004 from the National University of Singapore, where his doctoral research was on the phenomenon of jets in cross flow. He subsequently worked as an associate scientist at Temasek Laboratories at NUS and later as a research scientist there, specializing in flow control. He then ventured into fundamental high speed combustion research at the University of Texas Arlington as a postdoctoral visiting researcher. He was a lecturer at the University of Liverpool between 2005 and 2010, where he worked on jet mixing enhancements before moving back to NTU in 2010. Daniel's current research interests include experimental fluid dynamics and aerodynamics, vortex dynamics, flow physics, and uh, flow control in general. I'll hand it over to you, Daniel. Yep, thanks very much, Mr. Uh, for the nice introduction. So yeah, thanks everyone uh, for dropping by this afternoon for my seminar. Uh, so the title of what I'm trying to present here today, as you can see on the slide, will be on flow dynamics of uh, vortex rings colliding with solid boundaries. So yep. Okay, so this will show the scope of my presentation today. I will kick things off by giving a brief introduction of what sort of uh, work has been done on vortex ring collisions, what sort of scenarios have been looked at before, before uh, uh, going to what I have got to present today. And that will be on round cylinder collisions, whereby I'll showcase some of the results uh, that we got from some of our earlier experiments. Uh, through the use of laser induced fluorescence visualizations, you know, some time resolved PID measurements and the flow models that we propose to explain the flow dynamic. And it will be followed by a series of simulation results that we carry out uh, for the same round cylinder collisions. So I'm going to go through a little bit on the large eddy simulation results that we obtain. Uh, we'll compare the vortex structures and the behaviors that we observe. And, you know, of course, you know, compare with the experimental results that we obtained earlier. Last but not least, I'll go through some of the experimental uh, outcomes that we got them for our V-walk uh, vortex ring collisions. Once again, we make a sort of laser into fluorescence to visualize the vortex structures and trying to understand the optical behavior. And of course, uh, we're going to present the flow model that we came up with to try to explain the flow observations. And to round up the presentation, I'll give a, uh, you know, some sort of summary on uh, the results that we have seen so far All right, for vortex ring collisions that we, that we have looked at. Okay, so now, there are plenty of studies uh, that we've seen uh, over the past few decades, actually, all right, when it comes now to vortex rings colliding or interacting with solid boundaries. Now, what drives a lot of researchers, including myself, is that, you know, it may seem like a very, very simple flow scenario, but it's actually very, very complex at the same time as uh, those people who have, uh, you know, delved uh, into this subject matter, uh, no. So in many ways, it invokes some sort of like a very, very fundamental scientific curiosity. We just want to find out what's actually happening there, okay? Uh, not only that, it sheds light on vortex boundary layer interactions, uh, among other sort of uh, interactions. And I suppose uh, what's intriguing to me, at least, is that, you know, vortex rings can be treated simplistically, all right, speaking, as sort of like a building block for jet flux, if you think about it. So vortex ring collisions, in some way, should provide us with some insight, all right, on some flow fields, all right, such as impinging jets for heat transfer applications, okay, cold spraying jets for remanufacturing applications. Of course, they are much higher, but in some ways, they can be related. And last but not least, control jet noise, and so on and so forth, among other applications. Uh, now, some of the more common vortex ring collision scenarios that we've come across you know, over the past few decades will be vortex ring colliding with planar surfaces. There could be head-on collisions or you know, uh, collisions at some inclination angle. Uh, collisions upon uh, porous surfaces or permeable surfaces. And of course, you know, vortex ring colliding with convex or concave surfaces. Uh, for today's talk, we'll focus on vortex rings colliding with round cylinders and v walls, And the emphasis will be on the flow dynamics, OK? Now, this is by no means an, an exhaustive list, but uh, over here, I'd like to showcase some of the earlier studies that have been performed on vortex ring collisions. All right, over here, we've seen uh, these uh, this, uh, this papers, you know, uh, 
being published by all these uh, researchers when it comes down to vortex ring collisions upon planar surfaces, uh, collisions upon porous and permeable screens, and of course, you know, vortex ring collisions upon non-planar or non-conventional uh, solid boundaries. So this list, uh, of course, uh, will be on uh, studies, okay, conducted on discrete incompressible uh, vortex rings colliding with solid boundaries. There are other forms of, uh, let's say, compressible vortex ring collisions, which I will not touch upon during this talk, all right? <clears throat> okay, so let's move on to round cylinder collisions, okay? so. Uh, one of the reasons uh, that, 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 that really motivate us okay, to look into vortex ring colliding with a round cylinder uh, was due to studies carried out by Ren and Lin, as well as Ren and Oh, uh, back in 2013 and uh, 2015, when they did a, a three dimensional numerical simulation of a vortex rings impinging upon a circular cylinder. So, over here, I showcase some of the results taken from the 2015 paper. So, as you can see over here, all right, we have uh, the numerical simulation results showcase the rather uh, intriguing and curious uh, uh, vortex ring interactions with the round cylinder once it collides with it. As you can see, there's a highly non-uniform okay, kind of a vortex, uh, interact, uh, vortex interaction. And of course, as you can see over here, chances are that there's quite a bit of vortex stretching phenomenon uh, going on as well. Okay, uh, however, Okay, their studies proved to have a few limitations. Okay, uh, for one, okay, uh, the runner's number of the vortex ring is relatively high. If I recall correctly, it's about 40,000. So what happened is this translates to much faster transitions to flow incoherence, which makes it very, very challenging when it comes down to figuring what's the flow mechanism, how do the vertical uh, structures evolve and develop and dissipate and so on and so forth. And for that study, they only look at one cylinder diameter. In that case, uh, the cylinder to vortex ring, oops, sorry, the cylinder to vortex ring diameter ratio is fixed at 0 0.5. So they do not really look at uh, much larger cylinders or much smaller cylinders. And there's a lack of flow model to account for what's actually happening to the primary vortex ring once it collides with the cylinder and the subsequent behavior. So our motivations, all right, when we did this study was that we want to find out just how sensitive Okay, it's the collision process uh, towards the vortex ring runoff number. And what will happen to the collision process if let's say we use different diameter ratios, okay, instead of just one. And we were wondering back then, whether, you know, would it be possible for us to come up with some sort of a generalized vortical flow model to explain our experimental observations. So we conducted both experimental and simulation studies uh, to try to address uh, some of these above questions. So, you know, so for the experiments, we make use of uh, laser induced fluorescence, current risk of PIV, we look into the dynamics in particular detail. For the simulations, all right, we conducted uh, large ID simulations using open form. And really, uh, the simulations are there to give us three dimensional uh, flow insights because for our laser induced fluorescence and uh, time risk of PIV measurements, uh, basically, uh, they are 2D by nature. So the 3D simulations would give us a lot more understanding. Okay. <clears throat> now let's move on to uh, the experimental setup that we make use of when it comes out to the round cylinder collision. So as you can see over here, okay. So was, this will be the water tank that we make use of for our study. And what happened is we basically make use of a cylindrical slug approach, okay. And the nozzle diameter over here that we make use to produce the vortex rings uh, has got a diameter of 20 mm. The stroke ratio was uh, 30 mm, which gives us a stroke ratio of 1.5. So we make use of a relatively short stroke ratio so as not to form a trailing jet behind the vortex ring. So we're gonna get uh, relatively clean, discrete vortex rings. Uh, the runner's number of vortex rings that we look at, 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000, okay? But the cylinder diameters actually varies from uh, 20 mm, 40 mm to 80 mm, which is, which is rather nice because that's gonna give us diameter ratios of one, two, and four. So during the experiments, what's gonna happen is, all right, the program on the workstation that we make use for the experiment, all right, is gonna right, uh, be inputted into the motor driver and the motor driver will then drive the stepper motor, which in turn all right, will basically uh, impart uh, an impulsive uh, forward motion to the piston by this ball screw linear actuator. So this impulsively driven piston, all right, is gonna produce, all right, a vortex ring. 
which will then uh, be sent down uh, to collide with the round cylinder, which is placed at six diameters, six nozzle diameters, uh, downstream of the nozzle X. So for laser induced fluorescence, we make use of, uh, it's, it's a typical, it's a very, very classical approach, okay? Uh, we make use of fluorescent disodium salt and we premix with water. And what it's gonna do is one switch, you know, illuminated with a 532 nanometer laser is gonna appear as uh, with a greenish color. Uh, the dye uh, was fed into the apparatus uh, by gravity feed, and it's actually released circumferentially around the tube, right, just before the nozzle. I'll uh, make use of a two watt, 532 nanometer, continuous wave laser, with all the necessary uh, beam steering and forming optics. And all the flow patterns, the visualizations were captured by a remotely controlled DSLR cam. Okay. As for our 2D time results of PRD measurements, we make use of 20 micron particles, Okay, the laser sheet was produced by the same laser. Okay, but in this case, instead of using a DSLR camera, uh, we use of a one megapixel ambient light camera, uh, which captures the particle images at about <clears throat> 200 to 450 frames per second. And for the interrogation process, we use a multi grid approach uh, with an initial window of 128 pixels square and a final window of 32 pixels square with 50% overlap. So, of course, when it comes out to PIV, uh, processing where to uh, basically make us of global and local uh, rejection criteria and so on and so forth. And of course, the experience factors would be replaced by a three point by three point neighborhood skip for our approach here. Okay, so now before I present the results for round cylinder collisions, uh, I'd like to showcase what our visualizations and uh, time of PIV measurements are able to capture or right, for let's say a, a baseline case, a typical baseline case whereby a vortex ring actually collides with the planar surface, okay? So just to give you a sense, of, and also to compare with past experimental results to make sure that we're actually seeing pretty much the same thing. So I'm just gonna play back uh, the video, the visualization video. So you can see the vortex ring coming down, hits upon the solid boundary, thus forming <clears throat> quite a few uh, vortex ring structures. And over here, let me play back uh, PIV results, as you can see, it shows pretty much the same thing. All right, the primary vortex ring all right, collides upon the uh, solid boundary, as a solid surface, uh, thus inducing the secondary and tertiary vortex rings to form. All right, okay. So if we inspect, you know, uh, the frame captures, or right, the image captures uh, of the videos, Okay, essentially shows very clear formations of secondary and tertiary vortex rings. After the collision, the primary vortex rings actually entrain both the secondary and the tertiary vortices. So it compares very, very well uh, with earlier studies. So we are confident that our flow visualizations and time of PIP setup are able, are were able uh, to capture all these uh, flow behavior uh, satisfactory. Okay, now let's move on to vortex ring colli uh, colliding with uh, round cylinders. So uh, in this case, the results will be presented from the largest to smallest uh, cylinder. Uh, so uh, to better illustrate just, you know, uh, how the collision uh, flow dynamics will evolve as the curvature gets increasingly uh, uh, larger, smaller. So here you go. So this is, uh, vortex ring colliding with the larger cylinder here, which is the ATMM cylinder. And this it looks like. Okay, or maybe I'll just play back again. So the ring comes down, like the cylinder, and as you can see, we, you know, we can see the formation of the secondary uh, vortex rings and the tertiary vortex rings. But in this case, things are a little bit uh, interesting because what happened is if you look at the screen captured from the videos, once we have the secondary vortex ring forming here, all right? What happened is it doesn't really get entrained within the confines of the primary vortex ring, but instead it moves, or should I say both of them move towards the collision axis progressively as you can see over here before meeting along the collision axis. Uh, what happened is once they meet along the collision axis, they actually move in the opposite direction of the primary vortex ring uh, translation uh, direction. Okay, basically move in the opposite direction and move upstream or right, as a vortex dipole. Okay, so that really uh, that really caught our attention because uh, the next thing we were wondering is that, so what's gonna happen if the cylinder diameter actually gets smaller? So this is a cylinder with half the diameter 
All right, so the diameter ratio is two now instead of four. And this is what we get. So as you can see, as the vortex ring comes down, translates down, collides with the cylinder. And of course, we do see the formation of the secondary, uh, secondary vortex ring. But in this case, once the secondary vortex ring has been formed, it doesn't, it doesn't go towards the collision axis. It doesn't rotate about and move towards the collision axis. Instead, what it does, all right, as you can see from the flow visualization images here, it proceeds to move in the opposite direction all right, of the original vortex rings uh, translation uh, direction. So in this case, we do not just get one dipole in the, in a, in a, along the collision axis, or as we've seen for the largest cylinder. Instead, we get two vortex dipoles, okay, moving upstream. So it becomes uh, rather intriguing. Uh, we were very, very, uh, very curious when we performed the experiments for the smaller cylinder, okay? So this is for diameter ratio of one. So basically the nozzle diameter is the same as the cylinder diameter. And this is what we get. I would say that, you know, let me just play this back again. By and large, the collision behavior appears to be more or less the same, generally speaking. Okay, based on these 2D results, because what we do see, all right, is the formation of the secondary vortices, uh, secondary vortex rings, which then pair of the primary vortex rings, and instead of moving upstream, it's now moving at a certain angle. So as this frame uh, image captures will show, okay, once the secondary vortex ring has been formed here, okay, once again, it doesn't rotate back and move towards the collision axis, but instead it moves at a certain angle, as you guys can see over here, okay? And it basically does uh, interact with uh, one of the primary ring, uh, primary vortex ring cores here to eventually form a counter-rotating vortex dipole, as you can see. So from the experimental results, okay, we estimated that the angle, all right, between the trajectory of the vortex dipole and the collision axis is about 54, 55 degrees. Okay, so at this point in time, we were very curious because what actually drive, you know, because we're wondering what, what, what drive the different trajectory, what's actually happening. And also the dynamics, the flow dynamics associated with the larger cylinder here appears to be a bit different from that associated with the so-called relatively smaller cylinder. And that got us wondering, all right, okay. now. After we perform the flow visualizations to better understand uh, the vortical behaviors to have a first hand look, we perform uh, you know, uh, the time result PIV. So uh, I'm not gonna go through in great detail, but suffice to say that the PIV results essentially show us <clears throat> uh, uh, similar uh, experimental results as what we got them from the flow visualizations in terms of the vortex structures, the vortical behaviors. So, over here, you can see for the larger cylinder here, we do have uh, the turning of the secondary vortex rings towards the collision axis. And for the smaller cylinder here, we do have uh, the vortex dipole moving away at a certain angle away from the collision axis. Okay, so they give us confidence that um, we are actually seeing uh, the correct stuff over here, all right? It's not a <laughs> optical illusion, things like that. So now at this point, some of you might be wondering, so right, okay, Daniel, so we've seen the flow visualization along the convex surface. So how about the other direction along the straight edge of the cylinder? So what, what's actually happening there? Now, over here shows the flow visualization taken along the straight edge during the collision process, okay? And uh, if we inspect all right, this time sequence images uh, carefully, all right, one thing that's, that, 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 that really struck us was, hang on, it looks very much, okay, like a vortex ring colliding with a planar surface head on. Okay, we do see the formation, okay, of the secondary vortex ring, which gets entrained by the primary vortex ring, followed by tertiary uh, vortex rings, depending on which cylinder we're talking about. But one rather, uh, rather interesting observation that we made during the experiment was that <clears throat> we realized that the reduction Right, there is a great reduction in the vortex core physical size. Okay, and what happens is the smaller the diameter of the cylinder, okay, the faster 
the vortex core physical size all right, will be reduced. So we attribute that all right, to higher vortex stretching effects okay, as the cylinder uh, diameter uh, reduces, all right, which basically, uh, which carries up with our expectations actually. All right? But beyond that, okay, uh, nothing is too special about the flow visual, uh, the flow patterns that we observe along this plane. So, which makes life a little bit easier when we try to explain the flow mechanisms. Now, <clears throat> this is where I'm going to showcase the flow models uh, that we thought is actually happening, okay, for the, the round cylinder collisions. But we actually have got two different flow models, as I mentioned earlier on. One for relatively large cylinders. So in this case, we're going to uh, we propose a flow model that hopefully will explain the flow observations that we made for uh, the diameter ratio of four cylinder. All right, and there will be another flow model after this for diameter ratio of one and two cylinders. Okay, so we start off okay uh, through the conjecture. So what's going to happen is through this conjecture of this vortex range, let's assume it's coming down or right, moving downwards, just like we've seen the flow visualizations. And once it hits upon all right, the convex surface of the cylinder, it's going to wrap itself around the surface of the cylinder. Okay. And what happened is, okay, since the vortex ring is going to be colliding uh, upon the cylinder at different times, that means different segments of the primary vortex ring is going to collide with the cylinder. All right, at different times, that means essentially there's a sort of like a phase lag. Uh, and this is, uh, and what's going to happen is that the secondary vortex ring will be produced non-uniformly along the convex surface and gets entrained into the primary vortex ring non-uniformly as well. Okay, and what we postulate, all right, that this is what's going to happen. So the blue line here represents the primary vortex ring. And the red line here represents the secondary vortex ring. So as you can see in the figure here, the secondary vortex ring gets entrained by the primary vortex ring first along the straight edge then along the convex surface. And as time progresses, what we postulated is that the segment of the secondary vortex ring here is going to turn around, as we've seen in the experimental uh, visualizations, it's going to turn around okay, and move towards the collision axis. And in doing so, okay, it's going to form a loop this way. Okay? And due to the proximity of the vortex lines all right, associated with the secondary vortex ring here, we believe that there will be all right, a disconnection and reconnection process, which essentially will see the formation of a vortex ringlet. Okay, that continues to move towards the collision axis. All right, and the rest of the secondary vortex ring here, all right, it's going to look like this. So, so this is what we believe. Okay, now oh, is there a way to compare the experimental results? Well, in this case, we don't. We do not have a 3D experimental results per se, but we do have the 2D visualizations. So what we did to validate this flow model was to come up with a hypothetical cross-section, all right, okay, to basically come up with what we think we'll see, okay, if we were to do a visualization experiment, visualization for experiment, if you will, okay. So if we take a cross-section here, this will be the cross-sections and the various vertical uh, vortex cores that we're supposed to see. If this flow model is reasonable, it's plausible. So now once we have this, okay, we go back, we went back to our experimental uh, visualization results and we are able to basically, all right, uh, find uh, an image whereby it shows us, okay, the corresponding uh, vortex structures as you can see. So this ring here corresponds to this ring, this ring is over here, and this will be over here. And so on and so forth. And this is the primary vortex over here. Of course, it becomes rather turbulent. Okay, so, so at this point, we believe that this is more or less accurate. Okay, which gives us confidence when we try to propose the flow model for small, even smaller cylinders, because they are, it becomes a, a, a bit tricky because right, everything happens so fast for the smaller cylinders. So now, uh, I'll present the flow model for smaller cylinders. So this is for diameter ratio of two and small. By and large, the initial behavior, okay, we believe will be relatively similar. So in this case, all right, the vortex ring after the collision is gonna wrap itself around the smaller cylinder. But in this case, we do expect higher levels of vortex stretching along the straight edge. And once again, we do see non-uniform formation and entrainment of uh, secondary vortex ring 
Okay, so it's going to be passed along the uh, straight edge. Okay, and the segment of the vortex ring, uh, secondary vortex ring here, is going to be <clears throat> starting to move towards uh, away from the convex surface. But in this case, as it moves, it does not right, move towards the collision axis, as we've seen from the experimental results. But in this case, what we believe is happening is that, once again, just like the case for the larger cylinder, there should be all right, the vortex disconnection and reconnection uh, process over here due to the interactions between all right, the primary vortex uh, ring filament here, as well as the secondary vortex ring filament here. So it's going to cause a necking, all right, and the necking will lead to vortex disconnection and reconnection. And in this case, if it happens, we're going to get a vortex ring clip over here. But since right, it happens somewhere along the convex surface at a certain angle, the resulting vortex ring clip right, is postulated to move at a certain angle, as what we've seen from experimental results. <clears throat> so again, we make use of the same strategy, you know, uh, when it comes down to validating this flow model to make sure that it's possible. Once again, we take a hypothetical uh, cross section and we say that, look, right, if we take a cross section here, we should be able to see this. And went back to our experimental data and it appears that we do see pretty much the same thing. So yeah, so we were quite happy that we are able to find a plausible explanation okay, for the vortex ring collision behavior, okay, when it comes down to the very, very fundamental flow physics. And yeah, but one thing that actually, uh, that always bothered us back then was that a lot of this, in fact, the flow models and the behavior, uh, they were based on 2D results, 2D PRD measurements, 2D laser-induced fluorescence. And we're always thinking that, you know, shouldn't we do something that is going to give us uh, 3D flow behavior uh, understanding. And that's the reason why recently we managed to do some uh, large eddy simulations on pretty much the same uh, flow scenario, okay? So we make use of our large eddy simulations uh, and basically we make use of open foam, okay? Uh, in particular, we make use of transient incompressible pimple foam flow solver, okay? And uh, Basically, I'm not going to go through the details, you guys can read for yourself, but suffice to say that, okay, because it's going to be very, very tricky and very, very challenging to emulate the moving piston and hence the formation of the vortex rings, we decided to define the vortex ring, all right, ideal in an idealized manner through these definitions for its circulation and for the velocity field. So now these equations, we make use of these equations because we basically, uh, uh, basically, we followed the procedures that was adopted by Chen et al. in their 2010 paper when they, when they did a uh, vortex ring collision upon uh, planar surfaces. Okay, so we made use of the same equations, came up with the competition domain as shown here. So we have a cylindrical competition domain, and the cylinder is concentric. All right, it's located concentric within this uh, cylindrical condition, uh, competition domain. And over here shows the information of our mesh that we use. Okay, so as you can see from the smaller cell that we're able to achieve from the meshing. Okay, note that uh, it's a structured mesh. Uh, the cell size are sufficiently small to capture the small scale flow structures. And the large SD simulations were basically conducted using the carrier using parallel computing at the National Supercomputing Center, Singapore. So, yeah. But I think this is, uh, uh, in the end, we were very, very surprised by the simulation results because uh, it shows a great deal of three-dimensional flow behavior uh, and, and flow details. So again, just like the experimental videos that we've seen previously, the playback speed has been slowed down drastically because for right, ease in seeing the vertical, uh, the vertical structures and the vertical interactions. So, so for this particular case, all right, I'm going to show the ISO surfaces results. So ISO surfaces were uh, constructed based on the Lambda 2 identification of the vortex uh, structures and is color tech using streamwise velocity. Okay, and this will be the results for the larger cylinder. Uh, once again, this is a meter ratio of four. And this is what happens. You can see the vortex ring coming down and it approaches the cylinder. 
we collide with it. As you can see, you can see the non-uniform formation of the secondary vortex ring and the tertiary vortex ring. And what's interesting will probably be the secondary ring segments over here, which sees, right, which basically right, the simulation result shows them moving towards the collision axis. Okay. And if you look at the screen captures, all right, by and large, okay, it agrees well with the floor model that we proposed previously. Not exactly, but very, very close. Okay, uh, there's one discrepancy as well. Uh, in the flow model, we do say, you know, we do postulate that there's a series of vortex disconnection and reconnection that's supposed to happen over here prior to the collision, All right? That we do not really see that, even though we see some neck of the vortex, okay? Uh, but that could be due to the fact that we are making use, we, that we made use of an idealized vortex ring by the mathematical definitions as I've shown earlier on, rather than the piston driven, uh, uh, rather than vortex ring that produced by cylindrical slot model. So that could explain uh, this discrepancy. But in general, all right, this, this, this agrees uh, quite well. This is, this is with our expectations, okay, based on our vortex flow model. Okay. Uh, for the diameter ratio of two cylinder, this is what we get. So the ring collides with the round cylinder in this case. And as you can see, the non-uniformity formation, the non-uniform formation of the vortex rings, of the secondary vortex rings, the tertiary vortex rings gets even uh, more intense. And we do see this formation of the vortex ringlets. And these vortex ringlets actually move upstream, just like what we've seen in the experimental results. But having said that, if we inspect the screen captures, right, more carefully, there's quite a few interesting uh, observations as well because for the simulation, well, it actually predicts, you know, sure it predicts the formation of the vortex ring, but in this case, the vortex ring first, uh, apparently that takes after an elliptical outline. So it appears that these are elliptical vortex ring, right? Which subsequently actually undergoes bending, sort of like an X-ring switching process like we typically uh, observe for elliptical vortex rings. So these are rather interesting uh, observations that we did not really see in the experimental results. Okay, so yeah, uh, but then again, right, the necking and the, the necking of the secondary ring segments, okay, the vortex disconnection and reconnection process here, or actually they are being predicted well by the simulation. Okay, so at this point, we were very, very hopeful once we see this result because we're keeping our fingers crossed and basically tell and basically, you know, say that look, let's hope for the uh, smallest diameter, diameter ratio of one cylinder. Hopefully, it's going to turn out the way that we saw in our experiments as well. Okay, over here we can take a look. So this is for the diameter ratio of one cylinder. So as you can see, yeah, the secondary vortex ring segments actually has a necking, undergoes vortex disconnection and reconnection. So we were very, very happy when we saw these results. Okay. We were absolutely happy. Okay. As you can see the vortex ring that's moving at a certain angle away from the cylinder collision axis. Okay. Uh, and again, we do see that the vortex ringlets, even though it's been predicted by the simulation as well, which made us very, very happy because it agrees with the experimental results. Uh, in this case, once again, the vortex ringlets, they are not circular, at least not you know, predicted by the simulations. They're actually elliptical. And we do see some uh, extra switching like behavior and there is actually a flipping. Okay, a flipping of the major and the minor axis of the elliptical vortex ring. All right, so we are fairly confident that at least for the simulation results, Right, the vortex wrinklers are elliptical in nature and actually undergo vortex switching, which is something that we couldn't really tell from the experimental uh, results. Okay. So some conclusions, at least for the round cylinder collisions. Okay, so we conducted uh, laser induced fluorescence visualizations and PIV measurements for the experiments. Uh, we, show, we have shown that, okay, uh, based on the experimental results, that the collision process Okay, it's actually very, very sensitive towards the exact diameter ratio that you use. And even though I did not show here, we do have some circulation results uh, in, uh, in our earlier paper and the circulation uh, actually varies according to the collision <coughs> that, uh, 
according to the cylinder that we use. Okay, we found that vortex disconnection and reconnection process play a very, very important role when it comes up to vortex ring conditions on round cylinders. And it leads to small uh, vortex ringlets being formed. Okay, and simulation has shown that these vortex ringlets are actually elliptical in nature that undergoes axis switching. Okay, and again, I did not show here, but we also managed to map out the vortex core trajectories, okay, from the visualization images as well as the time result PIV results. And these vortex core trajectories actually they, they could be useful for comparison with uh, numerical approaches. And last but not least, okay, uh, the vortex uh, the vortex flow model that we propose based on experimental results, okay, appears to agree well with all right the flow behavior predicted by the simulations. And this gives us very, very important insight, all right, when it comes up to understanding just how the entire collision process is going to be like. Okay. All right. And with that, I'm going to wrap up the round cylinder collisions and move on to the V wall collisions. Okay. Now, when it comes out to V wall collision, okay, <clears throat> what we, uh, I hope, uh, I believe most of you guys would think that it's literally a V wall, and you'll be correct. And back then, when we, even before we started this, this, this investigation, this experimental study, we were wondering that shouldn't, shouldn't the flow be very, very similar to that of a vortex ring collision with an inclined wall, uh, right? Just how different can it be, okay? But we wonder, you know, a V wall uh, represents a far more physically constrained boundary, if you think about it, okay? Uh, Certainly, that's going to affect the collision process. So I'm just going to illustrate using a quick schematic. So this is what it looks like. If let's say we have a vortex ring colliding with an inclined surface, a very simple inclined surface. However, if we have a V-wall collision, well, things actually look a little bit different if you think about it, because now we're going to have flow that's been constricted here and constricted here. So surely the flow must go somewhere else instead of down the down the slope of the simple of the simple of the simple inclined wall, okay? Furthermore, there's a very important difference as well. For a simple uh, inclined wall collision, okay? So what happened is <laughs> these two vortex cores, all right? They're gonna collide with the inclined wall at different times. So that means there's a lag, okay? However, for a V-wall collision, these two vortex cores, they're gonna collide with the V-wall surfaces as, at pretty much the same time, okay? So surely, all right, something must give Okay, so we're interested in, in finding out. So, so just how, how different can that be? And of course, we're also interested in finding out what will happen if let's say the V-wall angle actually gets progressively smaller or becomes sharper, if you like. okay? And, you know, we're also wondering, you know, just how these results all right, uh, are gonna uh, tell us something or at least give us some clues on how <coughs> vortex rings actually, you know, how, how vortex ring collisions uh, upon concave surfaces, right, uh, are going to behave in general, okay, because this can be treated as a rather simple concave surface, okay. So, so these are the motivations behind uh, the study, behind the VA wall collision. So we want to find out just how sensitive is the collision process, right, towards the V wall angle, what's going to happen if the V wall angle is large, what's going to happen if the V wall angle is small, okay. And once again, okay, because we are very much interested in the vertical flow model. So we're wondering, are we able right, to come up with a generalized vortex flow model again for V-wall uh, V collisions? Okay, so we conduct the experimental study, all right, once again, using laser and use fluorescence, time of PIV, the experiment techniques are pretty much uh, basically the same, all right? And I'm gonna go through some of the experimental results over here. So the setup, as I've mentioned, is pretty much the same. We use pretty much the exact experimental setup. But of course, in this case, instead of having a round cylinder, okay, we make use of V plates, okay, two dimensional V plates with three different included angles, 120 degrees, 60 degrees, and 30 degrees. Okay, so these V wall angles, they're fabricated by joining very, very, simp uh, very, very simply two 10 mils thick, right, clear plexiglass sheets, and to prevent, we've realized that for this serious experiments, there's quite a bit of uh, light reflections. So we basically have to use quite a bit of uh, black ICC paper <clears throat> to mitigate the reflections here and there. And 
of course. All right, let's move on to the visualizations. All right, because uh, one thing to note is when it comes out doing, uh, when we did this series of experiments, vortex ring colliding with the round cylinders and this B was realized that you, one needs to have a lot of patience because even the slight base alignment between the vortex ring and the round cylinder slash V wall is going to give you highly asymmetric and incoherent uh, flow behavior. So we actually took quite a long time getting the alignment work. So yeah, uh, one has got to be very, very patient. So anyway, <clears throat> over here, it shows the 120 degrees V wall. Okay, it's the vortex ring coming down. And this is what we get. So again, the results are presented from the largest to smallest included angle because uh, if we start off with the largest included angle, that means it's easier to relate to a vortex ring colliding with a totally planar surface. Okay, so it's going to ease us uh, into the into the visualizations of what we mean. Let me just play this video. So the vortex ring comes down, collides the wall, and a cursory uh, look will show us that. It resembles very much like a vortex ring colliding with a flat surface head on, as we've seen earlier on. But in this case, it appears that more instances of boundary layer separation will actually happen. And we get no need secondary vortex rings forming, uh, or not just secondary or tertiary vortex rings forming, but also another couple of more sets of tertiary vortex rings. So that's what having this uh, V1 actually does to the vortex ring collision as you can see over here, okay? Now, <clears throat> things get rather interesting as uh, when we reduce the included angle to 60 degrees. When we first saw this with our very own eyes during the course of the experiments, we were wondering where, where did the vortex ring actually go? All right, I mean, since these are 2D experiments, so surely the vortex ring would have gone off the plane, but we were not prepared to see, to see it literally just disappearing from the 2D laser sheet. Perhaps I'll just play back again. So you can see the primary vortex rings, all right, the secondary vortex rings, the tertiary vortex rings, even though we can see them forming, all right, they literally just, just disappear from the visualization plane very, very fast. Okay, as you can see from the uh, the, the frames, <clears throat> the frame captures, all right, from the videos, okay? And it seems like even though the vortex ring has hit the wall, hit the, v, the sides of the V walls, it continues to move towards the valley of the V wall, okay? And things becomes really, really interesting uh, when we use up the, when we use up the smallest included angle. So we pretty much expect to see the same thing, okay? But in this case, the, ring, the, the, the vortex rings and the, uh, they literally disappear from the visualization plane. And that's why we realized that, okay, the visualizations of a plane that's orthogonal to this plane, right, that we've seen so far, right, should give us the most information in terms of the vortex dynamics, okay, which is what we proceed to do, all right, because over here, by and large, it's still, still explainable. All right, we're still able to find, uh, <clears throat> to see the structures that we do expect to see, all right, things seems uh, reasonable and, and we are able to account for it, but it's the behavior along the other plane that we're not too sure. Of. And over here, I'm just gonna show you what's happening along the octagonal plane. So for the 120 degrees uh, V wall, this is what happens. Here's the valley. The primary vortex ring actually bulges up tremendously once it collides with the valley, right? The lowest point of the V wall, it bulges up tremendously. You can see the formation of the secondary vortex rings, tertiary vortex rings, a whole lot of, uh, uh, a whole lot of uh, highly complex, highly three-dimensional vortical interactions and things like that, okay? <clears throat> when we reduce the included angle to 60 degrees, so what's gonna happen is the vortex rings actually interacted with the V walls, all right? Even before the vortex rings, all right, goes, uh, reaches the valley of the, of the V wall. And what happens is it means that the flow becomes uh, incoherent and transits the turbulence a lot faster. And surely that's the case, all right, for an even smaller included angle V wall as well, okay? 
uh, what we observe is that you know for this 120 degrees included uh, anger V wall, only the very early uh, only the very early stages resemble uh, uh, the behavior of that associated with a uh, flat surface collision. All right, the vortex causes a lot more bulbous. All right, basically, literally, I, I believe it means that the vortex ring actually undergoes quite a bit of uh, uh, vortical interactions as it moves away from the visualization plane, all right? And we do see some rather interesting small ring-like vortex structures from along the collision axis, okay? So based on our interpretation, okay, which derives from the visualizations obtained along the V wall as well as along the octagonal plane, we came up with this flow model. So what happened is when uh, the primary vortex ring Okay, moves towards uh, a V wall. And once it collides with the V wall, you're going to see the usual formation of the secondary vortex rings over here. But because of the shape of, of the V wall, what's going to happen is there will be, right, it's going to kick off a series of all right, circumferential flow along the vortex ring filament. Okay. And since the vortex ring continues to move towards the belly of the V wall, what's going to happen is this circumferential flow, okay, get more and more intense. And once you get more and more intense, it's going to push fluid, the vortex ring, okay, away from the collision plane, okay. And that will explain why, okay. When we look at the visualizations taken along the uh, along the V walls, we don't see. I mean, uh, the vortex ring just just disappears, quote unquote, right, from the visualization plane, okay. All right, so this is what we think is happening. Okay. So uh, future work, all right, we plan to do some uh, large headed simulations on this flow field because we believe that there could be something uh, a lot more convoluted that's happening. So we hope to do that soon, okay. But uh, anyway, just a few uh, quick conclusions on this series of experiments. Uh, we found that for this series of experiments, PIV results actually came in very, very useful. It's just that uh, for, the, for the time, uh, well, for the sake of brevity here, uh, I did not show the time result PIV results, but uh, it proved to be very useful because uh, as, you can, as you guys have seen, the vortical changes actually happened quite rapidly. Okay, and scalar division was quite significant. Okay, and okay, we found that, you know, as the include angle reduces, that means if the v, when the V wall gets sharper, so as to speak, Interactions between all the various uh, vortex rings intensify uh, significantly as well. The vortex ring cars actually disappear from the visualization plane, or right, the faster uh, when the V wall angle uh, reduces. Okay, we found that the vortex core trajectories actually are quite similar to those of an inclined wall uh, collision. It's just that they are, they've been reflected sym uh, symmetrically. Okay, at least in the earlier stages, uh, we found that uh, you know the primary vortex rings. Okay, uh, becomes very, very bulbous immediately after the collision, right? which is very, very interesting. It's not as stable as what uh, as we have thought. Okay, so, yep, so thanks for your patience. I'll just reach the summary page. I'll just summarize everything. So, uh, we, we, we've I've presented a couple of uh, vortex ring collision scenarios, uh, you know, other than visually striking, okay, from the flow visualization videos and fundamentally interesting. The shed quite a bit of uh, information when it comes out to various vortical interactions, you know, vortex boundary interactions, vortex boundary layer interactions, and of course, vortex vortex interactions. Okay. And even though the collision scenario seems very, very simple, okay, at least on paper, the flow field is actually not, is actually highly convoluted, which, you know, I, I personally believe that perhaps numerical simulations may not be able to predict. Uh, uh, you know, 100% uh, accurate. Okay, so this 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 will be useful. I hope uh, to to test out you know the accuracy of simulation codes. Perhaps, perhaps that's my that's my opinion. Uh, last but not least, I hope that the visually pleasing videos and flow images will hopefully encourage more people to go into this uh this this research topic. All right, so that we can understand vortex ring collisions a, a lot better. So. I do acknowledge uh, some people, all right, without which I might pass uh, present collaborators, researchers and students, without which uh, these uh, studies will not have been possible. And of course, uh, the agencies which made the studies, uh, which financially supported the studies in one way or another. 
So yep, I would like to stop my presentation. All right. And I thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. I'm ready for to address any questions you might have. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. So that was a really yeah. visually appealing presentation. I hope so. <laughs> well, I'll, um, I'll open it up for questions. Anyone interested can just raise their hands or just unmute and go ahead and ask a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting talk. Um, I've looked at vortex rings for a lot. Of, uh, my name is Min Chong, and I used to work with Titi Lim. Oh, yes. Um, I, I believe in that uh, many, many years ago. <laughs> many, many years ago. Okay. So the two limits of your case with a cylinder, right? So your cylinder rate, diameter ratio, if that's infinity, is a flat wall, basically. Right, so yes. D, big D, or little d equals infinity is the flat wall, which we have Correct. done. And then if the other limit is when big D or little d goes to zero, mm -hmm. it, what happens when the um, diameter ratio goes? See, I've done that before. I've, I've tried to put a, a vortex ring over a very tiny wire. So mm -hmm. what happens you now? How much, how much is it due to the boundary layer material being sucked up by the vortex ring? So if the vortex ring was big, and the cylinder was tiny, tiny. What happens? In fact, that's a very interesting case, All right? Yep. So I, to try to resolve, like using LES to look at what happens close to the boundary is not the right thing because it's not, you know, it's not like in the boundary layer where there's a large edges and, and then you model what happens close to the wall. To try to model what happens close to the wall, for example, in the cylinder is almost impossible. Even with the even with PIV, you're not going to detect what happens at the no slip wall. Uh, so that's uh, that's my comment. It's not really a question. Mm. No, no, uh, I thank think, you for a comment. Yeah, because I think is is see you know how when when Titi Lim and when Tim Nichols collided the vortex rings and they produced the little ringlets that goes out the other way. You see the little ringlets, right? It's like it's nothing to do with the boundary with the with the cylinder at all. It's to do with the instability of the vortex ring. Because we collided two rings, all right, that's together without a boundary, and they produce ringlets. But that took took ages. And Titi Lim is really patient. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 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 I you know that, that your comment is a is a very good one. Uh, and I think uh, you're right. You know when the cylinder diameter. All right, gets really, really tiny. You know, basically you have to use piano wires. You know, it's not a- Yes, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to put them really taut and you know, just like what I mentioned, you need plenty I, of I, patience. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you what happens in that case. All right? When I send it over the piano wire, or if I send it over very fine, like a ruler. So it goes to the ruler, you know, right? Has a lot of boundary limit and then it comes out the other side. And then I put it back on the, on the flat wall and the ring reconstituted itself. So mm -hmm. do how the vortex is stretching in the in the original ring. So I I don't think you need the boundary at all. It's it's quite complicated. So it's it's, it's uh, but I, I, I really like your talk because I I play with vortex ring for, for years. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so thanks, yeah. 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 thanks no problem, for the no talk problem. anyway. No problem, no problem. Uh maybe I'll just say a little bit. Uh I think <clears throat> there's one study by NITO. Uh, was he from Nagoya uh, Institute? I believe uh, uh, Naito. He did a uh, uh, quite a few smoke ring visualizations. I believe his smoke yeah. rings were, were quite large. So thankfully, I think yeah. it was like forty mm. So I think what happened was that when his vortex rings, uh, you know, sort of like collide with very tiny wires. So what happened was that his results show that there are so sort of like secondary streamwise vortices forming. Uh, at the, at the boundary of, of the cylinder, something like that. Yeah. yeah but it's, you know, if, if the if the cylinder is very small, you know, how much mm. boundary layer material can you yeah, generate? Not much. <laughs> not much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So hopefully I'll be patient enough to, to, to try this out in the future. Yeah. If I should yeah. try collision of just two vortex, like to what we did with the two vortex ring, which is mm. really hard to do. It's almost I impossible. Know. The alignment. 
<laughs> yeah, the alignment yeah, is yeah. impossible. Yeah. But they got a paper in nature, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, fantastic work. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Thank Thanks a lot. Yeah. No problem. You're welcome. Uh, any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, I, I have one, Daniel. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, what, was the, what was the reason for selecting 6D as the separation? Sorry, uh, which separation? Uh, uh, separation between the, the nozzle exit and the cylinder. Oh, uh, fantastic question. All right. So what happened was that when we did the... So, so what happened was that, you know, when we first set up, got this setup going, and we were uh, performing experiments on free vortex rings, just to make sure that the vortex ring actually, you know, that we managed to produce, are, you know, are actually okay, you know, to conform, you know, their, their circulations are okay, their vortex is okay, and most importantly, they don't, uh, they're, they're stable, you know, they're symmetrical, they don't sing or float just because of the dye we use and things like that. So what happened was that during the flow visualizations of the free vortex rings, we found that you know if the, the 6D for our experiment to set up is the Goldilocks distance, if you will. Oh. It's the Goldilocks <laughs> distance. Okay. Uh, if we go beyond 60, uh, the vortex rings, uh, depending on the vortex number, uh, depending on the runner's number, may start to develop the weak noise stabilities, the waviness and things like that. So that that will not work for, for what we're trying to do here. But if we if we use a distance that's smaller than 60, the vortex rings, you know, when we calculate the, the circulations and, and things like that, the behavior, we look at the behavior, it doesn't seem to be fully developed and stable. So we decided to use 60 uh, separation distance. And so far, it appears to work well for us. Right? I mean, that's the Goldilocks distance, if you will. All right. Yeah. <laughs> now, I was just trying to think uh, from the heat transfer point of view, uh, mm -hmm. because when you have impinging jets, you would usually want. I mean, the heat transfer is the maximum just nearest to the potential core. Mm -hmm. And that decreases as we go on at further nozzle to the surface yes. distances. So that's what uh, got me thinking. Mm -hmm. If, if yeah. that is, I mean, because the Goldilocks value for the impinging jet is quite different. I mean, for the oh. heat transfer thing. Yeah. yeah. Somewhere between two to four, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> when I presented uh, uh, these results previously, uh, uh, one question pop up. <laughs> just how many experiments did I did I perform just to get the, <laughs> everything aligned? Yeah. So I'm not too sure. Like I, I'm not too sure whether anyone is interested in finding out because uh, we actually performed close to about 200 plus experiments. All right, for the flow visualization, mind you, just the flow visualizations, mm -hmm. and from there we managed to get six to eight good visualizations. You know, all of which you guys have seen earlier. So, and just like what the uh, uh, um, Prof Chong uh, pointed out uh, earlier, yeah. On. yeah, the alignment is 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 absolutely crucial. And there were times whereby we just we, we were just wondering, you know, should we just stop? But <laughs> thankfully, we prevail. Uh, it, it really takes a lot of patience. And I thank my 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 researchers, my collaborators. They they they, they were absolutely brilliant. You know, they, they, so, they so, so the experiment. yeah. So, so the main challenge is, is, is getting that, that symmetry going. Is that the thing? Correct. The alignment, um, the fluorescent dye mix, you can't, you, 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 can't, you, can't, you can't mix too much of the fluorescent dye or else the vortex ring will just start to sink. And uh, <clears throat> the wait for the water tank to stabilize, you know, the water swelling, uh, the background turbulence to really damp out as much as possible. Yeah, so patience is key. Oh, yes, yeah. I forgot to add that as part of the experiment of setup. Patience. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. And I got one, I got one idea. I suddenly thought of an idea. Mm -hmm. Because the wall is a no-slip wall, all right? Let's say it's a planar wall and it's no slip. To actually work out what happens at the wall is very difficult. So you need to see, you need to, you know, like put lots of dots of dye on a sheet on a flat sheet of paper and run the ring against that sheet of paper, then you see you know the surface flow pattern. If you can get the surface flow pattern, you might get an idea of what the ring is doing. 
but I'm yeah. tired, so I'm not doing it. I'm <laughs> only suggesting for you, with your infinite patience, to do it. Yeah, yeah that, that's actually something that we thought of. Uh, in fact, we did some initial trials uh, quite, a, quite, quite, quite a few years back. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the, the dye, you know, because you have, to, you have to make it rather dense for it to stay along the, uh, along the bottom surface of the, of the, of the so if you use So if you use a dye, put, put some like, like oil in it, like winter green or something in it, so it mm -hmm. will flow, and then you shoot the vortex ring, and the vortex ring is going to, to you know, put lots of dots. Don't put like yeah. a dye, put lots of dots, oh, no. okay. and the dots are going to spread. Right. And you might get an idea of what the ring above the wall is doing. Because yeah. a no, no slip is, is a singularity. You're not going to get any flow close. The wall, the wall is no slip, right? The velocity is zero. Close mm -hmm. to the wall, the velocity is very small as well. Therefore, to see that, to see that velocity field, you have to do something. Yeah. You have to do something to the wall. I know it's a suggestion anyway. You, you no, no, it's a good it. suggestion. Yeah. Like I'm retired. <laughs> I'm retired. I'm not doing it. No, I can do it as a hobby. <laughs> yeah, th thanks very much for the suggestion. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, I, I think that's a good one. You know? uh, I never thought of that. Yeah, because previously we tried to put in a, a layer of dense dye at the bottom uh, and then shoot the vortex ring down. And, uh, but in the end, we, we found a lot of problems. Uh, that's what we should. Yeah, that's what T.T. Lim did. He put a lot of dense dye at the bottom. And then it shoot the vortex ring, all right? Mm -hmm. But now I think about it, it shouldn't have put a dense dye on the bottom. It should just put this little bit of dye so that the vortex ring can distort the dye. Then mm -hmm. you might get an idea of what's happening at the wall. Otherwise, like the, like the V wall, for example, all right? All I'm, I'm saying is that vortex, you know, if you have a axis symmetric vortex ring, that vortex ring is being stretched all the time. Therefore, dye is coming out the other direction. You can't see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, maybe that will give you some idea of what happens, you know, like a, like, like a tornado, or all the things get stuck in the middle of a tornado, that stuff got to go somewhere, therefore it going to up the, the axis of, a, of the tornado, all right? Mm -hmm. Therefore, same as with the vortex ring, right? It's being stretched, so all the, all the material gets stretched out and you get left up with nothing. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking yeah. of anyway. It's, yeah. it's an oh. idea, but... Yeah, thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, let, let, let me go back and think about it. I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah, do it. Let me know. <laughs> consolidate all my patients again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, any other last question? Uh, if not, let's thank Daniel for his talk. Uh, and thank you very much for you know, willing to give a presentation here. Oh, thank you for the invite. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right.